Media coverage provided by the CyberWire. Our popular daily cybersecurity news brief and daily podcast are online at thecyberwire.com. We are able to help extend the reach of the 2017 Women in Cybersecurity Conference keynotes thanks to the generous support of our sponsors. IBM. Silence and CyberSec Jobs. This just in, 50 million customers' data was not compromised this morning in a security breach that didn't happen. Wall Street not rattled at all. Oh. Sir, sir, what went right, what went right? Everything. We have a brief statement on this non-breach. We're happy to report there's nothing to report. My dad's company wasn't hacked today. Cool. All right, thank you everyone. I wanna say first of all, just thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak to this group. Uh, this is a pretty unique opportunity for me because I'm used to normally, probably, probably many of us here that, that are out of college and now in the workforce, used to more speaking to executives in the boardroom and to have an opportunity to speak to so many young college students and in particular young women uh, that are embarking on their careers in this really unique field is truly amazing to me. So, um, you know, first and foremost, I just want to say congrats to each and every one of you for actually being here today. Day because I think you're really head and shoulders above your peers in the fact that there is so much opportunity in this um, industry, in this space, and for those of you that are dedicating your time and your effort to come here is really truly commendable. Uh, so the video that you just saw, uh, you know, is a great video that was produced by IBM, but it gives you a little bit of a glimpse into the work that I actually do, and that's to protect our clients um, and their networks from being breached on a daily basis. So. Um, before I get into all of those great things that, that we said in terms of sharing advice and perspective, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my career. And I have to say, it, it feels a little weird to stand up here and kind of say so many things that, that are diving into my career, because usually I'm talking about technology and, and how to impact breaches. But the reason that I want to share those things is certainly much like the previous speaker. Um, I want you to be aware that these career opportunities exist. Um, quite frankly, there aren't, aren't too many people like me and like us in the sense of having had a career when it comes to incident response and certainly with being a woman in that field. And not only would I love to encourage you to follow in my footsteps, but I want you to completely shatter my path and take it to the next level and realize that, that those of us that have come before, that that's exactly what we want is to inspire others and for you to just make it better every day. So um, let me tell you a little bit about what I do. Um, so right now I'm at IBM and I lead our global X-Force incident response and intelligence services team. So that's a team of people that respond to breaches that also produce threat intelligence. We do a lot of research. We do a lot of analytics about emerging threats. So you know, many of you are studying really deep technical subjects. So uh, my team, you know, the types of skill sets that they have are things like malware analysis, forensic and live response analysis, intelligence analytics. Uh, network architecture and remediation. So just to give you a little bit of an idea about that. Um, I studied computer science when I was in college. And um, you know, at that time, there was not an organization like, like this organization, Women in Cybersecurity. It didn't exist. And you know, quite frankly, anyone that's my age or older, this whole career field didn't exist. So we didn't envision ourselves having these types of careers. Um, and you know, I really want to reiterate that, that this opportunity you have now, uh, this is a very dynamic field, but you really have the world at your fingertips in terms of the growth uh, opportunities that exist. So uh, I attended college, as I mentioned, did computer science, and I attended on an Air Force ROTC scholarship. And originally, I wanted to be a pilot. And throughout kind of my college career, I realized that maybe I didn't feel as passionate about that as I should, maybe as some of my co-work uh, colleagues, my, my, form, um, my students, 
did. And so kind of um, by a bit of dumb luck at an alumni career day, I heard about this um, field because a female graduate had come back and she was a special agent. And I was like, wait a minute, she doesn't wear her uniform and she carries a gun every day. That sounds really exciting. Uh, so I looked into it and I found they actually had this field called computer crime investigators. And it was really small. And you know, this was in the early 2000s and not too many people really knew what that was. And so I certainly had some luck in finding out about the field kind of at the last minute. But what I also had done was worked really hard as a student and as a cadet and allowed myself to kind of put myself in a position where my professors were gonna fight for me and they were gonna help me get that opportunity that was pretty unique at the time. So uh, my job as a special agent, I entered right after college. I had a lot of training in kind of hands-on computer forensic analysis, um, some malware analysis to an extent, but I basically spent five years doing you know, hands-on running computer intrusion cases uh, all over the world. I, I spent a tremendous amount of time in the Middle East during the second Gulf War. Uh, I actually was stationed just down the street here at Davis Monthan Air Force Base in Tucson. And I mean, I, I loved my job. The mission was incredible. Incredible. Uh, the work that we were doing was great, um, but I often tell people that the final year I was in the Air Force, I uh, spent 300 days uh, uh, on the road. I actually moved into a storage unit and I lived out of a suitcase. And that was a lot of fun, but I realized I didn't want to do that forever. And the other thing was, um, and you know, I know there are a lot of cadets here from different, um, from West Point, I think from the Naval Academy and from other units. Um, yes, yeah, so absolutely want to shout out to those girls. Um, but the thing is, at the time when I was in the military, if you continued your career and you got continue to get promoted as an officer, you were going to enter leadership roles that really pulled you away from the technical work that you were doing. That's that's different now, actually, in a very good way. There are leadership opportunities um, that continue in the military for kind of all different ranks. But at the time, I wasn't going to be able to continue to do that. So I made the decision to move into the private sector. So I moved to Washington, D.C., because most of the jobs at that time were there. And I evaluated a number of different opportunities. And there was a small company uh, that just kind of stuck with me uh, because they were so passionate about what they were doing. And many of you uh, might now know that company. So it was Mandiant, which is now the cybersecurity powerhouse. It's FireEye. And um, I just felt that there was this kind of palpable energy in the room that we were going to do something really good there. I didn't know what it was. Um, but I ended up spending six years at Mandiant. Uh, not only doing incident response investigations, but also you know, learning how to write proposals and review contract language and actually make sure that our clients paid us after we delivered the work. And that was really a benefit of being in a small company is that you get this exposure to do uh, a little bit of everything because there just aren't enough people to do the job. So, um, you know, and at my, as my time in Mandiant came to an end, when I looked for the next opportunity, uh, it, I wasn't at the point where I would say it was comfortable on a daily basis. You know, the speaker earlier, uh, Michelle, did a fantastic job about talking about being comfortable, and I'm going to talk about that as well. Um, I wasn't to that ex uh, to that point per se, but I felt like there were opportunities and experiences that I really needed to get that I wasn't going to get continuing to stay where I was at. So. Um, I got the opportunity around that time to join uh, what was also a very small company called CrowdStrike. Um, hopefully many of you are aware of them now. This has been a big press year uh, for them because they ran the investigation. Uh, it was actually my team that ran the investigation um, into the DNC and the breach with the Russians and involvement in the election. So I've uh, been pretty interesting in terms of all of the press that's happened this year. Um, but you know, I spent four years there and I would say I felt like I earned three MBAs during that, that four years because we, you know, I had left this company that was really kind of at the peak of the industry and to go to kind of just start from scratch and build a team from zero and educate our clients on what we were doing and you know, work with the technology that was still being built. And all of you that are engineers knows it takes some time to build a technology that works, especially at an enterprise level. So a lot of challenges along the way. Um, and then to be honest, I, I wasn't looking for a new opportunity when I was approached by IBM. That often happens and it will most likely happen to you in your career as well. Um, but I was starting to get a little bit of that itch in terms of realizing I'm getting more comfortable. You know, our team is awesome. I had hired some fantastic people. We had great clients who were doing really good work. And there were a couple compelling things to me about IBM that, um, 
you know, as I, as I share kind of highlights and how we make decisions in your career, I would encourage you to think about these things this way. So for me, there was three components. One was the data. And in the field of threat intelligence and analytics and incident response, and those of you that are data nerds, and my sister is a data scientist and nerd that loves crunching through data, um, you realize that if you have a lot of it, you can make some really cool analytical decisions from it. And IBM was sitting on the world's largest amounts of security data when it came to our clients and our internal data. Um, two, there's this, this guy you might have heard of called Watson, and we'd made a lot of investments in him. And uh, ultimately, we truly believe that Watson and cognitive analytics are going to really accelerate the work that we do when it comes to threat intelligence and incident response and remediation. And then third, I felt like there was an opportunity uh, that the company was truly investing in the space, that there was good executive visibility, and that we could probably be really successful doing something in this space where, you know, right now, kind of boutique firms are leading it, but in this space with the power of IBM behind that scale that they offer, truly excited about that opportunity. So, uh, you know, that said, uh, you know, looking back, I've been at IBM for a year now, and that's hard to believe because the time has flown, and it's a mix of really being proud of the work that we've done and the team that we've already built, and waking up every morning still feeling like, my God, there are so much more work to do. We have so much to do. But I think that almost all of us in this room, whether you're a college student feeling that way or whether you're an executive, you probably all feel that way. Um, so now that you have kind of a little bit of background as to where I've come from, um, I want to share with you some of the lessons that I've learned. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it. Actually, we'll keep going here. Uh, but in particular, how I think that you can leverage them. So it's no secret that this is a women in cybersecurity conference. So I want to talk a little bit about what being a woman in a traditionally male-dominated field is like, um, some of the challenges that you're going to face, but how I think you can leverage many of those to your benefit. Um, you know, these are some lessons that I would have loved for people to tell me along the way. So if there's kind of one tidbit you can take, then hopefully that's good news, and, and we share and kind of keep pushing the ball forward. So the first one I want to talk about is the power of being underestimated. Uh, there's a couple components to this. So first and foremost, um, people are going to notice that you're a woman. And when you're in a room, and you might be the only woman in a room of all men, um, people might make comments. So I'm not going to lie to you and tell you that I've never had an inappropriate comment made, uh, or I've never had some um, you know, discerning remark simply because I'm a woman, because that certainly has happened. But I will tell you that I don't think I've ever missed a career opportunity or growth or been um, passed over simply because I'm a woman. I actually think that um, I and others that I work with have really been able to leverage that to our benefit. So I want to share that with you. So uh, it's important to me and for all of us, I think, to really understand the lens through which others view you. Because when you do that, you can then kind of effectively start anticipating some of the things you might face, and then really anticipate and, and plan kind of responses that are going to help you be more successful. Um, so you're going to hear things like, um, you're too pretty to be smart. You can't possibly be technical. Um, you're not pretty enough to be competent or add value. Or you may hear things like, you're too young. Um, there's no way that you have the experience to do this job. Those are kind of things that you're going to hear, and I can't recount the number of times I've been um, told by men and women um, who have immediately kind of assumed, and this is no, no, um, not being dismissive at all to sales or marketing or any of those folks, but the, the assumption that that's the type of role you're in because you couldn't actually be technical if you're a girl, right? So um, obviously, I think many of us in this room are changing that paradigm, but it's important for you to understand you might hear some things like that. Um, what I want to say is that while people might judge you initially based on looks, the win is if you can leave them remembering you based on your credibility because they are not going to forget that, and they are not going to forget that they underestimated you. So um, understanding that some of these things happen, I think really allows you to focus on preparing effectively, making sure that you've channeled that hard work that you've done into that meeting, that opportunity that you have to truly make an impact in a discussion, and prepare for it in a way that people have no doubt about why you're there and the value that you bring uh, to that equation. 
Uh, that's ultimately what you want to focus on are the results and how you can go about getting them and channeling kind of that attention that you might get. Being the person that looks different in the room, channel that to your advantage and to remember and kind of make that mark. The last thing about uh, being underestimated, um, and Annie I think did a great job of commenting on this earlier, but um, it's something that I've spent a lot of my life doing and I'm sure many of us here do. If you don't, then literally you're amazing and keep doing it. Um, but that's the ability to underestimate yourself and to kind of sit in that room, whether you're in a college class, um, you know, and you're, you're in your programming class and you're sitting around and you're kind of like, oh, I don't really get what the professor just said, but no one else is asking questions, so I must be the only one who doesn't get it sitting in the boardroom saying, hmm, okay, everyone else here, man, they seem really smart. Um, they're all smarter than me. I'm gonna kinda stay quiet because maybe I don't have enough, to, enough value to add in this conversation. Um, that's really kind of the worst thing that I, th I think you can do. It's important to observe and to learn and to prepare and to work hard, but it's also really important to understand the value of your own voice. And we've talked a lot about diversity and it not, doesn't relate just to genders. It, uh, there are a number of results that have proven that really diverse teams produce more creative results, faster results, and so um, when you have those moments, I would encourage you to speak up and have your voice heard. And not to be your own worst enemy. Um, but again, like Anna said, there are other people around you that believe in you. Um, make sure you're the number one person in that. And it's hard. Believe me, it's very hard. But I know you can do it. Because for me, it's something that I think about, kind of that inside voice, um, every time I go into a difficult situation. Right. So on the next note is something that I think is uh, can be somewhat controversial. Uh, as a woman, uh, talking about emotion, right? So we've all heard, well, women are emotional. They're, they, you know, they're not as smart because they just get so upset about things. Um, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about some lessons I've learned with that, but how I really think that emotion can actually be one of your most powerful uh, mechanisms that you have in the workplace. So one story I wanna tell is, so when I was growing up, you know, my father was a, a coach. He'd played baseball in college and he'd coached for his entire life. And I started um, as a softball pitcher, a fast pitch softball pitcher, when I was in about junior high. And as I, as I started, I, I mean, I'm a redhead, let's admit it, right? I have a temper, I can be pretty powerful and passionate about things. And uh, I would get so mad if the umpire was calling a strike zone that I didn't think was fair, and if the other team was beating us or they were getting good hits off me, I would start to get really mad. And he saw this and he was like, you know, hey, Here's the deal, like one, as a pitcher, you're kind of responsible for leading the rest of the team. And the tone that you set is incredibly important. But two, when you get upset and you stomp around on the mound and you let the other team know uh, that they're getting under your skin, that's to your own detriment. And you know, he said, it's not that you can't feel those things because everyone feels those things, but you can't show it outwardly. He said, you know, his mantra was never let them see you sweat. And it was uh, something that I've translated into the boardroom and into meetings on a daily basis. Um, you know, when it comes to incident response, we're dealing with clients, it's a tense situation. Uh, they're worried about losing intellectual property, maybe they're losing money, and maybe the people that we're working with individually are actually worried about losing their jobs. So these are very, you know, crisis-driven type of situations, and to be able to, to come into them, you better believe there are times when I'm nervous too, that we don't have all of the facts, we're not sure exactly what's happening, um, but I can't show that, and that's actually translated very well because it uh, allows me and my team to kind of come in as that commanding voice of reason that's a calming influence on the people that we work with. Um, on the other hand, though, what I want to say, so while I think that channeling emotion, especially in terms of getting results, is a great thing, what I don't want you to think is that you can't show emotion at all, because emotion can be very powerful. So um, it's funny because I had this circumstance actually happen just two days ago. So I was in a meeting uh, with one of my team members who reports to me directly, he leads a team, and we were working with another organization internal to us, and ultimately I had 
I felt, um, kind of going into the meeting, that they hadn't really been doing their job up to the expectations of, of what mine were, and that they weren't providing us kind of the service they needed to do. And so we got into the meeting, and they started, you know, kind of criticizing my team member and saying, well, you know, you didn't really do this the right way, and so as a result, we couldn't do our, our job, right? And I interrupted, and, you know, I didn't yell, I didn't scream, I didn't swear, but I made it very clear that I felt like they weren't uh, living up to my expectations, that they weren't servicing our team the way I thought they should, and that there was going to be no more discussion about my team member, because I explained all of the work that they had done leading up to this, and that if they weren't going to give us results, then I was going to talk to someone who would, and my next step, my next call was to their supervisor. Um, there was silence <laughs> for a little bit, and they came back and said, okay, well, what is it that you're looking for? And I said, this, these are the actions I want as a result of this. And you better believe, one, my team member appreciated that I had his back, and I stood up and I let them know that they were no, there was going to be no more kind of trouncing on that person. And two, the other team, um, I will say within 24 hours, got the results that we'd actually been asking for for two months at this point. Um, so they knew that, hey, okay, if we talk to her, she's not necessarily going to be a pushover. Um, my team appreciated that I showed I was upset. And the point there, I think the most important thing is really that we got the actions that we were looking for. We got results. And so when you have a goal, keep that in mind, but you can absolutely use passion um, and emotion to your benefit too. People like to see, especially if you're calm more often, they like to see you get upset about things and stand up for what you believe in. Um, my last note on that is um, I actually have a few bosses at, at IBM uh, as we're developing kind of this new structure. They're all fantastic. Uh, one of them in particular, though, has said, you know, I like talking to you um, because when I talk to you about what we're doing here, I feel the passion in your voice. I feel that you're excited about what we're doing, and it translates to me going back into the office and taking on more things and just driving towards the results. So that's also a hugely powerful tool, is when people understand you're excited about what you're doing. Um, I loved, though, the general's comments this afternoon when she talked about work. And, you know, the quote that, you know, if you do what you love, you'll never work a day in your life. And she found that kind of humorous, and I couldn't agree more. Um, I love what I do, and I've been very fortunate to have a great, uh, great jobs and a great career. But man, you're, you're going to feel like you're working for sure. There are going to be days that suck and that are not as wonderful. But if you are excited about having a goal and understanding kind of what you're driving for, that is definitely something that's going to help along the way. So on that note, uh, the next item to talk about is kind of uh, the importance of taking calculated risks. So. I think to do that, for me anyway, I can share a couple of examples of where I've come from and, and how, um, how I took some risks along the way. So when I first joined Mandiant, uh, you know, I think all of us now, or many of us, at least if you're familiar with this space, you know it's this big company. But when I entered, it was 30 people in an architect's office that was painted blue and orange and super funky, and no one had heard of us. No one had any idea of what we were all about. And you know, if you had a problem, you kind of knew who to call, but the industry didn't really exist at that point. And so when I joined them, there are people who said, well, why are you joining that company? I mean, they might not even be able to pay your paycheck next week. Um, are you sure? Did you study their financials for, you know, for the last year? Um, I had just come out of the Air Force, so I certainly didn't know to study anyone's financials at that point, nor would they have probably provided those to me at the time. But I mentioned earlier that energy that I felt, and I thought, you know what, even if the company falls apart, I think I'm going to get some good experience here. Um, I mentioned that joining a small company, I was going to get the opportunity, um, which I had an inkling of an understanding of, and no idea quite how much opportunity of the breadth of experience I would get not only delivering the work, but all of the other components that go along the way with building a company, learning to recruit, learning to sell work, and then ultimately on all the financial sides. So the thing I will say is that when you take risks, even if they're calculated, there's a large part of your time that you're just going to feel uncomfortable. So for me, I spent the entire first year that I was at Mandiant um, nearly every day and sometimes every hour, feeling really uncomfortable. Like I was surrounded by people who knew a lot more than I did and that 
I was just going to, you know, one day people were going to find out that, you know, I didn't really actually know what I was talking about, right? So I went into my performance review at the end of the year with my boss. Um, and, you know, I thought, okay, you know, I think he's going to tell me I did these couple things okay, but he's going to say, these are all the things you can work on and you can improve on these areas. And what happened was he told me I was getting a promotion. And I almost fell out of my chair. I was shocked. I said, oh, um, oh, really? Oh, okay. And, uh, you know, he said, well, yeah, are you surprised? And, and I kind of said, I knew, it, I knew the right answer wasn't, well, yeah, of course. You know, but I, I said, uh, maybe a little. And, you know, he said, well, hey, he's like, you have, and, and again, Anna mentioned this, but on the communication side, he said, you have skills that some of my other team members don't have. You can communicate very well with our clients. You somehow motivate your team members to get this work done, even when they don't really want to do it. And, uh, and you work really long hours, and you work harder than some of your peers. So the fact that he realized that was really pretty cool. But it kind of gave me, um, it, it certainly shocked me and reminded me again about that whole thing about not underestimating yourself. So another risk uh, that I took and that I actually received kind of a lot of criticism was when I left Mandiant to join this other really small company called CrowdStrike. Uh, Mandiant was at the top of the game. We were running all of the coolest investigations at the time. And uh, CrowdStrike was an unproven entity. And you know I kind of looked at the opportunities, but I realized that what I was looking for at that time was to really expand into being able to recruit and build my own team entirely from scratch. And I realized that even if the company failed, that I thought that the, the opportunity kind of outweighed the risk in terms of um, really being able to make me a better employee on the back end because of the experiences that I was going to have. Uh, and thankfully, the company has done exceptionally well. And, uh, and we've all been able to kind of look back on that success. So moving on from that, so choosing experiences that enrich your career. Um, you know, we talk a lot about being in your comfort zone and that not really, like when you get to that point, kind of realizing that you may need to stretch yourself into a different role. Um, so what I want to say there is that a big part of evaluating different opportunities is really to look inside and identify what kind of experience is it that you actually want. What are you looking to do next? And, and by the way, I don't mean you have to have like a 20-year vision of your career because most of us haven't and, uh, and good things will happen regardless as long as you work hard. But keep thinking about, you know, what kind of experience you have now and maybe it's a new technical experience, maybe it's a different skill set uh, that you're looking for. So. Uh, when I first started uh, originally, kind of back at Mandiant again, I took a job supporting NASA and uh, on behalf of Mandiant. And what was interesting about it was it was a job that other people didn't want to do because we were running a lot of commercial um, investigations. They were really fast paced, very exciting. It was a new challenge every day. And it was like, oh, well, NASA, I mean, that's a super cool government agency, but it's the government and they move slow. and oh, I don't know if I can do that. And I said, you know what, I'll do that. And what it required me to do was go to the headquarters building in Washington, D.C. every day for the first year that I was at the office and to listen to the problems that they had and to get to know the team. And yeah, there were days when it wasn't as exciting as what my other colleagues were doing. Um, but within two years, it wasn't just me that was on the contract. We had, then had 30 people on the contract, and not only at the headquarters, but we were supporting other, um, other NASA centers, and we were helping them build our security operations center. And had I not taken that job, I would not have had the opportunities that I've had subsequent to that. And my point there, and actually one other real quick opportunity, was similar when I joined IBM. Um, and I point this out because IBM is a very big, powerful company, but it's huge, and it's been around a long time. And if you do incident response, that's not always what IBM has been known for. And I had a number of friends, I can't even recount the number, who were like, IBM? What are you thinking? You know, that's kind of weird. Um, and uh, also a number of them who said, well, you know, I, I interviewed for that job too. And uh, somewhat smugly and said, but you know, it, uh, it just sounds like a lot of work. And to which I kind of smugly replied, yeah, it is actually, 
but we're going to kick your butt in the next couple years, and you're going to kind of remember that most likely uh, as we move forward. And so I ask you to remember that and encourage you to look at opportunities that maybe other people don't want, but to evaluate why. Is it because they appear to be too difficult or too big or maybe not as exciting as others? Because a lot of times they are kind of diamonds in the rough and you can have great opportunities that come from taking those challenging opportunities. So the last item that I want to talk about um, is probably to me, I think if you take away only one thing from this discussion, um, I've titled this kind of choosing personal partnerships versus relationships. Um, and I think more important than whether you take a job at Facebook or at IBM or whether you work in London or New York or you become a malware analyst or you become a software engineer um, are the decisions about who you surround yourself with. Uh, and who you surround yourself with very closely. And I think that nothing, uh, no other decision will have more direct impact on your success and whether or not the way you live your life and how you build your career. So I'm not talking about just your friends. They're, they're very important too. And certainly, uh, again, Annie mentioned positive people and positive influences, absolutely. Um, but when you look at who you're going to kind of build your life with, I mean, whether that's a boyfriend or a girlfriend at this point and in the future, maybe it's a husband or a wife or who knows what, um, the reality is they don't have to have the same dreams that you do, but they need to have the same dream for you as you do. And that is so critically important because nothing is going to kind of allow you to kind of push forward. And when you have those moments where you're presented with an opportunity, uh, you know, it's funny, there's, there's an article out about our CEO, who is a woman, actually an amazing leader um, named Jenny Rometty. And she's the CEO of a 110-year-old technology company, the first female CEO. And earlier on in her career, she got presented with a huge opportunity and uh, from her boss, and she got it, and she kind of said, oh, well, you know, let me go home. I'm going to need to talk to my husband about it. Which, thankfully, she went home, talked to her husband about it, who said, are you crazy? Your answer is yes, and if there were a man that were asked that, he wouldn't have said, I need to think about this and go home. He would have said yes. And the, impor the important thing there to me was not just that you know she say yes and she think about it like a man does, because those are, are good skills as well, but the person that you're sharing your life with helps push you to where you want to be. And um, uh, there's a couple components to that. So I, I'm going to go, uh, go rogue here, but we've been candid pretty f so far today, a fair amount. Certainly Michelle earlier was. And, you know, I had a boyfriend who once told me, uh, you know, you would be a lot more successful if you had bigger boobs. And maybe you should get a boob job. And uh, now, needless to say, that boyfriend did not last very long. But another thing that he did was when I had a success, he was also you know, very successful, had a career he was building. When I had a success, he was excited, kind of. He wanted his successes to be bigger. And I share that story uh, not to be crash, crass, but to um, alert you. These are the kind of things you kind of want to look at as you're a college student and moving into relationships. You know, How does that other person um, react? What do they do when you have success? Because Ultimately, um, if they want you to succeed as much as you want to succeed, then that's probably going to be a really positive thing, and it's going to have a very huge impact on, on your career moving forward. So in closing, um, you know, I mentioned earlier about this field. I think that every one of you here have such a world of opportunity ahead of you. Uh, the, this field, uh, there's estimates. Uh, that range from 1.5 to 1.8 million jobs that are going to be short over by the time many of you graduate college in this field alone. And that means you're going to have a tremendous amount of opportunity uh, to do what you want and to take advantage of it. But I want you to realize that you're also going to have to make some of your own luck along the way in the sense of, of preparing, working hard, so that when the luck does come, that you're prepared to take advantage of it. So thank you so much, and have a wonderful evening.